Hello. Thanks a lot for coming. I'm very happy to see so many of you here tonight. I know it's been a long day and this is the last two talks, so thanks for staying here. So my name is Peter. I'm a protocol engineer at Scroll, and today I want to tell you about a recent rollup improvement proposal that is called L1 S load. So let's start by talking about what is L1 S load. Essentially, L1 S load is a pre-compile that is deployed on L2s like Scroll and other L2s that you as a dev developer who deploys your dev on L2 can use to read state directory from L1. So if there's any Solidity devs around here, this is how it looks. So this is the contract that you would deploy on L2. It's very simple. You can just take the L1 contract address. You can provide one, two, or up to five storage keys. You encode it and then call this pre-compile. And then at the end, you get the result back that you can decode and use in your application logic. Uh, what happens under the hood is that the sequencer fetches this data for you to a JSON RPC request. Or it can even look uh, as simple as this if you, if you provide some higher level uh, libraries. You, you know, just call the L1S load uh, read unsigned int, and there you can use the data in your L2 contract. Now, today, Today at the venue, I passed this door, and I like this kind of as a metaphor. Uh, so l one thought is essentially about keeping the door to storage open to your L2 DEP. Before we go into the implementation, uh, let me highlight some use cases that we've discovered, because we've been running this through some hackathons in the last few months. Uh, one of my favorites is this uh, cross-layer tornado cache. Imagine that you can deposit some tokens into the shielded set on L1, and then you can withdraw on L2. Uh, very seamless user experience. Or imagine that you deploy your DAP on an L2 that doesn't have ENS. In this case, you could just uh, use L1S load to directly look up uh, names from the L1 ENS. Another example is DeFi. So you could create uh, a DeFi DAP where you can borrow an L2 direct by directly using collateral on L1 without bridging this from L1 to L2. And for account abstraction wallets, you might have heard about key stores. The idea is that you manage all your keys on one chain, let's say on R1, and when you update your keys, you add or delete a key, uh, this update is automatically propagated to all your wallets on all the chains. So this last example would look like this. Uh, in the R1 contract, you would most likely have some kind of a mapping where you store the authorized signers. And on L2, it's very simple. You just calculate the storage slot that you're interested in, and then you can call L1S load read bool. The sequencer fetches the data for you, and you can decide in your L2 wallet whether this signer is authorized or not. So L1S load makes this very easy to implement and also very easy to use as a, as a developer. Uh, now that you have a general understanding of what is L1S load and what are some use cases, let me talk about why do I think we need to provide this in the sequencer level. And the way I think about this is that this is a, a service that the sequencer provides to you, basically MPT proofs as a service. Uh, because this is all doable already without relying on this pre-compile, but it's very complex as a developer. First of all, relaying the state root information from L1 to L2 in a verifiable way is very complex. And then for any interaction on L2, providing this MPT proof is costly and also complex to develop. So let's just do the sequencer and the prover do the heavy lifting so that you as the dev developer can focus on the cool application logic that you want to develop. There have been some serious, there have been some alternative proposals to l one in the past few years. Uh, two that we know of are L1 call and remote static call. And these are more powerful in a way. So from your L2 contract, you can directly call a view function on L1, basically execute a full EVM uh, function. But these are, in our experience, not very friendly to ZK rollups, so uh, the proving is costly. And also, for instance, Scroll's execution environment for which we have a prover is slightly different from L1. So if within that prover, you would need to implement another execution environment for Ethereum calls, and that makes this very hard to develop on ZK rollups. On the other hand, L1S thought has the, the issue that, you know, if you interact with a contract and it's upgraded and the storage slots change, that might be a challenge or that might be an issue. So this is something you need to consider as a developer. In that regard, L1 call would be more powerful. All right, now let's, let me show you how this is implemented in, in our reference implementation in the sequencer. There are two prerequisites before we jump into the implementation. The first prerequisite is what I call trustless block hash relay. 
So the L2 network, scroll in this example, needs to have a notion of uh, what is the latest L1 block. Basically, it needs to have a view of the L1 chain, including the state route, because you need the state route to, to verify these proofs. Uh, some rollups already support this. Uh, the way it works uh, in our system, although it's not launched on mainnet yet, is the sequencer optimistically relays blocks from L1 to L2. We verify that these indeed form a chain of blocks. And then when we finalize this back on Ethereum, uh, we check that the sequencer relayed the correct data. So if the sequencer tries to cheat, then it will be unable to finalize this on L1. So this is doable, but this is one of the prerequisites. The other prerequisite is that any L2 node, including non-sequencer nodes, so follower nodes, must connect to an L1 node. Because as I mentioned, this pre compiled call is translated into an RPC query. So currently, not all rollups enforce this. Uh, you might just follow the unsafe chain from the peer-to-peer -peer layer from the sequencer. But if you want to support L1 S load, then all nodes need to connect to an L1 node. Given these prerequisites, it's actually quite simple. The execution part of the pre compile is quite simple. Uh, I copied the example from our Go Ethereum fork. So you would just need to extend your EVM implementation to add a new pre compile. And what it does is, first of all, it needs, it, it needs to read the latest layer one block that we know of. In our case, this is stored in states, but this might be implemented in other ways. Then it needs to parse the inputs that the developer provided, uh, execute a batch RPC call. So even if you read five storage slots, the latency is the same because we can batch these queries. And then resume execution and return control to the EVM execution. So that was the execution. And on the verification side, as I mentioned, we need to verify uh, the block hash relay. So verify the L1 header chain and verify that the sequ sequencer relayed the correct information. And then as part of the proving process, the sequencer also fetches these MPT proofs uh, so that you as the developer don't need to do that. And inside the prover, we need to verify all these layer one MPT proofs and make sure that these were all correct. Now, we have this roll-up improvement proposal, but this is still a draft and there are still some open questions. And the main goal of this talk is to involve more people. So if you're a developer who might be interested in using this, then we'd love to hear, for you, hear from you, see what you need. Uh, and if you are an L2 protocol maintainer, you know, you're maintaining a sequencer node and you're interested in adopting this, then we'd also love to hear from you to share your input. So I want to highlight three open questions. Uh, one open question that we received from devs actually is that, like, do we want to allow L2 applications to read L1 state at arbitrary height? So not just the latest L1 height, but maybe older state. Definitely for some applications, this is required. But this also has some drawbacks. For instance, if you allow reading old states, then the nodes must connect to an archive L1 node. And for some L1 nodes, like Wrath, I believe this is not even possible because it cannot serve historical uh, get proof requests. Another question is, how do you deal with RPC errors and latency when you execute uh, these calls to the L1 S load precompile? Latency is, is a big question mark to me because if there's a latency between the L2 node and the L1 node, you know, the RPC query, that might affect the throughput of the system. That might slow your system down. So you need to consider that when you price this pre-compile. And if you encounter an error, you need to decide, do I retry or do I drop this transaction? And finally, defining the gas cost is also tricky. So in our proposal, we have a very simple pricing mechanism, basically a fixed cost per pre-compile call and variable cost uh, or another fixed cost per the number of slots that you're querying. But this is not all. You also have to pay for producing and verifying these MPT proofs. Uh, that is probably you can do some benchmarking to price that. And what's kind of tricky is to price this RPC latency. Like what is the cost of doing this RPC query on the sequencer as opposed to processing other transactions. So we still have some way to go. This RIP was proposed in June and uh, it's now gaining some traction. We've been ex exploring some use cases. But the next step would be to involve more uh, L2 dev developers and L2 protocol teams. So as I mentioned, we'd love to hear fr from you. Uh, just recently, we set up a working group Telegram channel. So if you're interested in joining the discussion, feel free to join. If you cannot join for some reason, then feel free to message me on Twitter and I add you. And I really hope that we get support from at least one other L2 team and that we can ship this feature on at least two L2s maybe in 2025.
And in this presentation, I also have some resources, both uh, the reference implementation, the ETH Magicians link, and we also have some uh, resources for devs, uh, DevNet, and some example codes that you can use to get some inspiration. That's all I have for today, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We have a few questions. So, first question is, what happens when I load a state from L1, but then L1 reorgs? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, when does the sequencer relay this? If the sequencer is conservative and it waits for L1 to finalize, then this won't happen. But then the user experience is not very good because the latency is uh, 12 to 15 minutes. If the sequencer uh, relays it earlier, maybe after a couple of minutes, then you as the L2 need to be reorg aware. So you need to detect reorgs and you need to reorg along uh, with the L1 most likely. But I think this is the same problem that L2s have with uh, deposits. So any information that's related from L1 to L2, be it L1 S load or deposit transactions have the same issue. Okay, next, next question is, what is the latency of data relay from Ethereum to L2? Yeah, so that's essentially, it boils down to the same question. Like if you wanna be conservative, just wait for finalization. If not, you need to reorg re along with R1. Um, in reality, it's not terrible because I think R1 hasn't had a reorg deeper than seven slots or is extremely unlikely. So as long as you have a mechanism to reorg, if there's a deeper reorg, then this won't really be triggered in most scenarios. Uh, but there's still the issue on one of the inactivity leak. What if L1 doesn't finalize for a long time? In this case, definitely uh, being more aggressive and not waiting for finalization would be the way to go. Otherwise, user experience would suffer. Okay. Next question is, why is it only limited to five keys? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you need more than five keys? If yes, then please let us know. Five is, was just an arbitrary number. We didn't want to make it unbounded. Uh, for most application use cases that we explored, five or less was enough. But if you think it's not enough, then uh, this is still draft, so we can still change it. Okay. Uh, which state or block does this opcode load form? Uh, is it the latest Ethereum block? It is the latest Ethereum block that this L2 blockchain knows of. So um, there needs to be, on this L2 network, it has multiple nodes, sequencer and follower nodes. They need to have a consensus about what is the latest L1 block that they see. Otherwise, uh, execution to calls to this pre compile would diverge. Uh, but this could be implemented in different ways. I mentioned this as uh, one of the prerequisites. And I would say this is not in the scope uh, of this RIP, but it's a prerequisite that could be implemented in different ways for different rollups. OK. Uh, what happens if there is a small reorg for the specific L1 node at the tip? Then the L2 sequencer would process incorrect data to the L2. How would execution continue on the L2? Yeah, same question as before. So you would need to most likely reorg along with L1. Okay. How do you configure switching the RPC node on a live sequencer? How do you configure switching? Well, I mean, you can get fancy. I mean, the easiest solution is to just compare, connect to one node, but obviously that's not robust. What if the node is down? So ideally, you would set up multiple L1 RPC nodes. Uh, ideally, multiple types of L1 clients, and then have a load balancer, and then you can dynamically switch off and add nodes. Uh, that's r robust for the sequencer, and for L2 nodes, probably it's enough to just uh, run a sing single L1 node. Okay. Um, is this the same as the previous questions, or is this a separate question? When I load L1 stage, should I specify L1 block number? It's a different question. In the current version of the spec, you cannot specify an L1 number. In a previous version, you could. So as I mentioned, this is one of the open questions. And I guess we did need to learn more for, from developers to decide which way to go. OK. Uh, when, we, uh, will, when will S, uh, L1 S load be available on mainnet? Soon, I hope so. But this is not very useful if only one rollup ships it. So I hope at least two rollups can ship it next year. If somebody wants to know what is RIP. So RIP stands for Rollup Improvement Proposal. This is similar to the EIP process that is for L1. And we have a less binding 
kind of collaborative process for L2 that is called RIP. Oh, time's up. Um, thank you. And if anybody has any more questions, uh, please find him uh, by the stage. Thank you. Thank you.